Well, in the 1960s, the butterfly effect became a popular explanation for the inaccuracy of weather forecasts. So th this is the idea that if uh, you know you get a small disturbance on one side of the world, it creates it kind of ripples through through chaos and creates a storm. But I always thought this was a, a very strange theory, actually, because you know when you think about it, if you flap your hand in front of your face, you don't get the feeling that there's some sort of exponential force rippling out from you, which is going to change the world. And I think there's actually a much simpler explanation for this, uh, perhaps not as nice, but it's just model error, right? Which is, uh, w when you try to model a complex system like the atmosphere, there are at least two major problems. The first is emergent properties. So local effects in complex systems lead to emergent properties that by definition cannot be reduced to simple physical laws. So an example for this is clouds, and these are formed when water droplets locally cluster around small particles in the air, such as dust or salt. So there, there is no law or equation for a cloud, right? These, these equations of, of fluid flow do not, they break down under those circumstances, and all you can do is, is approximate it very roughly. Uh, secondly, complex systems are dominated by nesting and opposing positive and negative feedback loops. So as an example of feedback loops, for clouds again. Heat increases va water vapor, which increases cloud cover, and this cools the atmosphere, so that's negative feedback on heat, except at night when it does the opposite and heats the atmosphere, which is positive feedback. So these forces are in a delicate balance, which makes model sense due to small changes. And you, you see a similar problems when you're modeling and predicting other kinds of complex systems. So for example, in biological systems, you have positive feedback, which allows for rapid response, negative feedback, which provides control coupled together. In the stock market, you have momentum buyers versus value investors. So this, I think uh, Heraclitus, uh, the Greek philosopher, put it best when he talked about this harmony of opposite tensions, right? So that the apparent stability is actually a truce between strong opposing forces, which means that the situation can change suddenly as in earthquakes or financial crashes. So how about economics and, and business? Well, economic forecasting has actually followed a rather similar path as uh, weather forecasting. So the orthodox neoclassical theory uh, was developed in the 19th century. It was inspired by Newton's rational mechanics. But is the economy like a machine? Do people behave like atoms? Well, uh, Newton didn't think so. As he, as he wrote in 1721, after he lost most of his fortune in the South Sea bubble, I can calculate the motions of heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. So orthodox theory, uh, you know, nonetheless, uh, continued going. And, uh, if you recall, I mentioned that the, the Greeks, the assumptions behind the, the models of the Greek models of the cosmos were very important, circles and so on. And uh, neoclassical economics theory also makes the same, you know, some strong assumptions about people. So the, the theory assumes that individuals who are, are the atom of the economy act independently and rationally to maximize their own utility. So this led to the idea of rational economic man. Everyone knows it's a caricature, but it's been a very influential one, as I'll show later. And uh, then Adam Smith's invisible hand drives the economy to a stable equilibrium, so everything is nice and, and still. But these assumptions were used to build general equilibrium models to predict the economic weather, but it's turned out that this is even harder to predict than the real weather. So this graph shows uh, uh, changes in gross domestic product in the United States, the big solid line, and then the forecast from the Department of Energy. And actually, you know, Economic forecasts, especially for that kind of time span out, really are not much better than random. But in the 1960s, uh, again, a little bit like with the butterfly effect, an excuse came along. The efficient market hypothesis became a popular explanation for why forecasts go wrong. And this is a physics-inspired theory, which assumes that price changes are random perturbations to an optimal steady state, so markets cannot be predicted. But According to this theory, you can still calculate the risk based on the normal distribution or bell curve, which uh, is a, allows you to express the, uh, the risk of an asset by a single number, uh, which is very convenient. And this led to all sorts of formulas such as black shells, Gaussian copula value at risk, these, these risk uh, um, uh, forecasting techniques, which played a very big role in the recent financial crisis, as it turns out. So do these mechanistic assumptions stand up? Why is it that economic storms still comes as a surprise? Well, if you look at some of these assumptions that we're making in our forecasting models here, a theory assumes that the invisible hand drives the economy to a stable equilibrium. But you know, if you look at an asset like gold, you can see that at least since it was released uh, 
to, to mark because it hasn't been very stable. And this is something that we can understand from nonlinear dynamics, which says that stability is a property of certain very special systems. But something like gold, you know, the reason that you buy gold is because you think or hope it's going to go up in value, right? So if it's going up in value, we all get excited and we buy more, and that drives the price up further, so that's a positive feedback. And then kind of the same thing in reverse on the way down again. And this leads to this characteristic boom-bust behavior, uh, which you also see in other assets such as oil. Um, oil is often called the lifeblood of the economy, but back in 2008, it looked like we were having a cardiac event with this, this huge spike. The, the forecast here, the dashed lines, are again from the Department of Energy. So this kind of unpredictability, you can say, well, okay, it's consistent with the idea of our efficient markets, our, our model of the economy, but it doesn't prove it. I mean, if you think, you know, this link between efficiency and, and unpredictability, I mean, snowstorms are un unpredictable, but no one says that they're efficient. But the theory also says a lot of other stuff about price changes being small, random, independent, and so on. But as we know, this, isn't, this doesn't describe the economy. The, the fact is that large changes frequently occur, as in September 2008, when it was nearly lights out for the economy. And the reason is that statistics are not normal. They're actually, they follow something called a power law distribution, which is identical to what you see with earthquakes. Okay? So it means that, you know, just as you have lots of small tremors in the earth, and most of them you don't feel, and then every now and then, but there's always a possibility of a, of a huge extreme event. It's the same with financial crashes. They, most of them, you know, most price changes in the market are very small, but every now and then, there's always this possibility of an extreme event. They're not normal. <laughs> And finally, you know, the theory assumes that people act independently, make rational decisions to optimize their own utility. Proof of market equilibrium actually assumed infinite computational capacity and the ability to look into the future. Uh, rational expectation theory is, is this is a little bit like we're modeling ourselves as if we're as omnipotent as the all-seeing eye which adorns the back of every US dollar bill. But as we know, the, the truth is actually a bit more like this, right? That we're all prey to uh, emotions, especially during something like a financial crash. So just to sort of stand back and look at this, uh, the, the way that we're modeling ourselves, you know, the, the economy, the world system, our orthodox theory and forecasting tools are based on these ideas of stability, symmetry, order, and logic, which go back to the ancient Greeks. We model people as if they were perfectly rational and can look into the future. We model the economy as if it obeyed the harmony of the spheres. But it's far more wild than that, right? You know, uh, the same goes for the climate. The, the climate system is a wild system. We are far, far more wild than that. So we're, we're doing something a little bit like what the Greeks were doing. Because when, they, when the Greeks modeled everything with circles, they were, they were kind of making an aesthetic statement. They were, they were projecting their aesthetic values onto the universe and saying, you know, that, that's the way it is. Um, but there's one important difference, which is that the Greek models could predict when the lights were going to go out, right? And, and we can't do that. Our models don't have that predictive validity to them. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, do we need another Newton or, or just a new approach? Well, I think there, there are new ideas coming from the life sciences, which is a, gives us a very different way of thinking about the future. So. The idea is to go from seeing the world as a machine, kind of a Newtonian machine, to seeing it as a living organism. And uh, just to go through some of the properties, so complex organic systems from a living cell to a society to the Earth's atmosphere are characterized by emergent properties. Uh, these systems operate at a state that's far from equilibrium rather than static. The only, in biology, the only things that are stable are dead. Systems exhibit uh, power law as opposed to normal statistics, network dynamics as opposed to individualistic atomic dynamics. There are these opposing positive and negative feedback loops create an internal dynamic tension. And all of this results in inherent uncertainty, which means that mechanistic models which attempt to capture these effects tend to be highly unstable and not very good at predicting the future. So in, in recent uh, years, new mathematical techniques have been developed to, to, to work with these systems, and these include things like network theory, nonlinear dynamics, agent-based models. This uh, figure at the, at the bottom is an agent-based model of a, of a growing tumor, so the agents here are individual cells. Uh, similar methods are now being used in economics to simulate things like the, the banking system. Um, but back to the question of prediction, you know, if it sort of raises the question, if we can't predict something like the economic crisis, what about an environmental crisis, which is of a scale which is likely to, you know, definitely affect the way the world looks in 100 years' time? And 
I think what we have to acknowledge is that prediction is possible for some situations, but we, we need to acknowledge this uncertainty of living systems. And, and here the, the medical analogy is perhaps appropriate. Uh, doctors routinely assess health and provide advice without trying to make specifically timed catastrophic events such as a heart attack, but they can still give general advice. And I think in the same way we can use models and data to improve system health and explore future scenarios. So in scenario forecasting, you don't try to say, okay, the future is going to be like this. What you do is you draw a few alternative different scenarios to kind of prepare yourself mentally for them.